Dajia hao. Now, I realize that for someone who didn't post a week 9 and week 10 training recap video, talking about Wushu Mastery might seem a little suspect. But in fact, my recent challenges with Wushu are exactly why I did a deep dive into what it takes to master Wushu. Are you confused? So am I. Let's get into it. You know, by my nature, I'm not someone who likes to give explanations about why I didn't do the thing I was supposed to do because it sort of feels like an excuse. Even if it isn't, even if the reasons are valid, like in this situation, it still feels like I'm just making up reasons for something. And it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But rather than focus on that, I thought I should really be more introspective and analyze what really happened. That feels a little more proactive and positive. So needless to say, week nine and week 10 were sort of a bust. So first I'll give the reasons or explanations about what happened. And then I'm gonna do a deep dive in to see what the root core issue really is. And as you'll see, talking about these core issues is gonna take us on a journey to better understand the fundamentals of building Wushu Mastery. There are some serious layers to this onion that we're about to peel. By the way, if you're new here, my name is Mark. I'm a Wushu enthusiast and Wushu Adventures is where I explore this amazing world of Chinese martial arts. Wushu 52 is my project to get back into Wushu shape at the age of 52 during the 52 weeks of 2022. If that sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and subscribe, like, blah, 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 all that good stuff. So let's go back to the beginning of week nine and refresh exactly what was going on at the time. The Baha'i Fast was starting, which is where I don't drink or eat from sunrise to sunset from March 2nd to March 20th. And I knew it would be challenging to work out while I was fasting, but I didn't realize just how much. I also recently started a new project at work that's got me working kind of late hours and has a very tight deadline. And if I didn't mention it before, I also teach a class at the University of Hawaii. And while teaching a class isn't necessarily a burden, it does suck up my nights and weekends. So what exactly happened? Well, I guess you could call it like a perfect storm of personal life challenges. Monday night for week nine, I ended up staying up until about 4.30 in the morning working on this project. I had a big presentation the next day, meeting the next day, ended up lasting about two or three hours. And I only got about two hours of sleep because I got up at six o'clock in the morning to have breakfast and have some coffee and because the fast was starting. Of course, the lack of sleep, as it always does, aggravated my joint inflammation, and I was hobbling around a bit during the day too. So I knew that given the lack of sleep and in my weakened condition with the joint inflammation, working out on Tuesday wasn't a good idea. And normally I would just get enough sleep Tuesday night to make up for that, but I had to do video feedback for 21 students that night, which is a two hour video, not including editing, rendering, all this stuff. So I didn't get to bed until like 1.30 or two o'clock on Tuesday night. And again, this is the beginning of the fast. So I wasn't eating or drinking during the day. My energy levels were really low. By the end of the week, I was so exhausted and so tired that I ended up sleeping from 7 p.m. on Friday until 4.30 p.m. the next day. That's like 20 hours of sleep if you don't count the hour and a half I was up for breakfast. You know, a lack of sleep and energy really clouds your brain. I was pretty disappointed that I hadn't trained during week nine, even though I knew that I would likely get injured or worse if I had tried to. You know, sometimes it's better to rest and recuperate rather than push yourself beyond your limits, especially since I was only week nine into my Wushu training. But even knowing that I had valid reasons didn't make it any less aggravating or disappointing for myself. You know, I've been told over the last week or so by more than one person that I'm kind of hard on myself. And that might be true, but I can't help these gut reactions. It's just how I feel in the moment. Even though intellectually, I might realize that that doesn't make sense. Emotionally, I feel disappointed and upset with myself for not doing the thing I wanted to do. Not to mention the fact that I promised to do it for all of you guys. And I've had some of you asking me, hey, what happened to the recap videos? And of course, that just made me feel <laughs> worse, even though I appreciate you guys asking, you know, yeah. The other thing I realized during this past week or two is that I had forgotten just how difficult it is to train Wushu while you're fasting. It's been a while since I've had to do that. And even when I used to do it in my 20s, 30s, it wasn't nearly as bad. I could have like a hard boiled egg or a protein bar or some piece of fruit on the way to Wushu and I would still be able to train without any problem. But now in my 50s, I'm finding that that's a lot harder than it used to be. So 
Lesson learned. So while my emotional gut reaction is to feel disappointed, my intellectual reaction is to try and analyze and understand what caused this in the first place. How is it that just being on a fast or not getting enough sleep completely derailed two weeks worth of training? And after spending quite a bit of time over the last week and a half or so thinking about this, I came up with a few ideas. Because the reality is it isn't the work or the fast or teaching or the lack of sleep. There is actually a deeper root cause for what caused all this in the first place. And I haven't really talked about this much, mainly because it's a little embarrassing. I mean, none of us like to expose our character flaws, right? It makes you feel very vulnerable, but we don't grow and develop as individuals unless we address these things and these challenges that we have in our life. It doesn't help to bury your head in the sand, right? But all of those things, the joint inflammation, the lack of sleep, I think of those as really symptoms of the core issue. Here's the thing, most of us in our lives have to deal with the same personal character challenges or individual challenges over and over again. They're different for everyone, but for each person, we might have a specific personal demon that we're always struggling with. And so for today, I wanted to talk about a specific challenge that I've been having for most of my life and how it's been affecting my wushu. But you know what? It's kind of cramped in here and it's a nice day outside. So why don't we take this puppy on the road? So as I was saying, I think that everyone, to some degree or another, has some personal recurring theme or challenge or growth issue that they're dealing with in their life. And it's different for everyone, but for me, this recurring challenge over the last many decades has always been consistency and follow through. Following through on a commitment to our project or a process. You know, I'm really good at planning. I'm good at executing an initial part of a plan but it's the follow through, it's the long term sticking to that plan that's always been challenging for me. And I've always marveled at people who are able to stick with something and able to do it day in and day out for the long term. I have friends who are amazing, they're like robots, they can just keep chucking away at something for years and it's never been something I have been able to do. And I guess in some ways Wushu 52 is sort of my effort to work on this issue for myself. I guess I figure 52 weeks is a long time. There's gonna be highs and lows and I'm gonna falter and I'm gonna suffer and I'm going to succeed at some certain things. But it's a project that I'm committed to trying to work on this issue for myself. And this past week or two has really shown me that this is still an issue I really need to work on. And after many years of working on this shortcoming, quote unquote, there's a lot of things I've learned. I've done a lot of reading and watching about habit formation, about following through on things. But perhaps ironically, while I've been consistently reading about habit formation, I haven't been consistently following the advice and creating habits. You know, I, I've probably read and listened to the book Atomic Habits by James Clear at least 20 times. I've been following him for 11 years now, since 2011. And as much as I completely agree with almost everything he says, I, it's hard to implement. A lot of the main literature about habit formation talks about how most people lack a system. They lack a process or a plan that they can follow or they're not able to organize their life on a schedule. I think anyone who knows me will argue vehemently that not being able to organize or schedule things is not one of my shortcomings. I have a black belt in organizing things. And I think it's probably because I've been dealing with this issue for so long that that's usually the first advice someone will give you is, oh, you just need a system to follow. And I've created systems and plans and schedules and that is definitely not my problem. Having a system doesn't necessarily necessitate that you're able to implement and follow that system long term. So if it's not a system, 
That's my issue. A lot of other people might say, well, maybe you're lacking a strong enough why. Your commitment to that process, your purpose is not strong enough. And while there is definitely a certain amount of grit and determination that is part of this process, I don't feel like my commitment to Wushu 52 is any less today than it was January 1st. I still really want this to happen. But wanting something to happen doesn't make it happen. And wishing for commitment and follow through doesn't magically make it appear. And if a lack of a system or a lack of commitment are not my issues, then what is? And after a lot of introspection over many, many years, especially recently, I've come to the conclusion there are two core reasons why I have this challenge. Number one is I have slowly over time lost my ability to focus. Or on the inverse of that, I have an abundance of things that easily distract me from what I'm trying to do. And two, I have an overabundance of aptitudes and interests. Or on the inverse of that, I rarely have just one thing I'm working on or just one pathway that I'm going down. What focus I have is usually split between many things. And I believe these are the two things that are really inhibiting my ability to commit and follow through on things and to be successful with my Wushu training in progress. Not that I haven't had some success so far. I have. You know what I mean, right? So what is the solution? How can I adjust my approach and address these issues? Well, if you don't mind humoring me, I'd like to go down a bit of a rabbit hole. Specifically, I want to talk about one approach I've learned on how to be productive with skill development and see how it might apply to my effort. First, we'll look at this approach and then we'll see how it applies to Wushu and even more specifically how it applies to Wushu 52. And you might get something out of this too, so hopefully it's helpful for both of us. And this really stems from a person named Darren Hardy. You may or may not be familiar with him. He's a success coach, a well-known speaker and author about personal development. And he gave a keynote talk back in 2013 called The Productivity Secrets of Super Achievers. I know, the name is kind of out there, but the information in it is... Mm. If the video is still available, I'll put a link in the description below. But one thing he says in this keynote talk is that most of the fundamentals of success or most of the fundamentals in any skill area or any development area really boil down to about half a dozen or so key fundamental processes. Whether you're doing a sport or a business or whatever, there's those half dozen or so fundamentals that if you master them, you will succeed. You know, James Clear talks about this in the Atomic Habits too, that 1% of marginal gain that compounds over time to create a massive change. In fact, Darren Hardy even wrote a book called The Compound Effect, which also talks about this compounding interest of small changes made over time that will create big waves of change in the future. And with productivity, which I equate to being uh, affecting change over a long period of time or being able to create results over a long period of time, which is my exact challenge, he identifies a half dozen or so fundamentals on how to work on these productivity skills. So I recommend checking out the video for the full breakdown. He gives uh, lots of examples and stories, but I'm gonna give you a brief summary of them here and how they apply to Wushu and how they apply to Wushu 52. All right, so what is the first master skill of productivity? In his words, stop doing what other people do. You see, most people say yes to opportunities. I mean, it sounds silly saying that because why wouldn't you say yes to an opportunity? But he says that the number one master skill of success is the ability to say no. You know, Warren Buffett has a technique where he has you write out all the different projects, all the different things you wanna do, all the different opportunities you have, and narrow it down to just the top three and take the list of everything else, crumple it up and throw it away and never look at it again and only focus on those top three. And he says that's the first level. That's where you can get success. But if you really want to go to the next level, take two of those things, throw them away and just focus on one. In the book Essentialism by Greg McEwen, he talks about this idea too, that the word priorities didn't actually become plural until the mid 20th century. Before that, it was a singular word just priority, a single thing. You can't have multiple priorities that's actually oxymoronic, somewhat paradoxical, you know, and everyone tries to do a lot, but rarely do people try to do one thing to the highest degree. It's like the Bruce Lee quote about the 10,000 kicks, not fearing the man who does 10,000 different kicks, but fearing the man who does one kick 10,000 times. And what is that one technique that matters? What is the one thing to focus on? Uh, there's a story that he talks about with Richard Branson. And Richard Branson was once offered $250,000 to give a keynote talk. And Richard Branson, people came back to the people wanting him to do the talk and said, no, he's not available. And then they said, well, okay, $500,000. Well, give him $500,000. And the people came back and said, nope, sorry, he's not interested. And then they said, okay, uh, just give us a number. What number would, would he be willing to talk for? And they said, right now, Richard Branson has three main things that he is focused on. 
And if the opportunity is not within one of those three things or move them forward, then it's a flat no. Half a million dollars and he says no because it's not one of the main things that he wants to focus on. And I guess that's why he's Richard Branson. It's not that he can say no because he's Richard Branson. It's Richard Branson because he says no. And this is not what most people can do. If you get a really great opportunity, you're probably gonna say yes. That's just the natural inclination that we all have. Most people don't have the ability to say no to all but their main priority. So how does this apply to Wushu? I sort of see this in two ways, internally within Wushu and externally outside of Wushu. First is saying no to obligations or opportunities that distract you from training Wushu in the first place. These are both things that come from other people, like, hey, I have this really great concert tickets, you, uh, would you like to come? Or, hey, I got tickets to the game, you wanna come with me? But it's the same night as your training. Having the ability to say no to going to do those things and train instead. Or just for yourself, internally, saying no to TV shows or video games or hanging out with friends or job opportunities in order to pursue your wushu. You know, a story about uh, Brandon Sugiyama. Hey Brandon, if you watch this. I remember one time he was competing at CMAT and he was like the only person from his group of friends, the training friends, who came to the competition to compete. I might be paraphrasing, sorry Brandon. But everyone else was down in LA for a Beijing wushu team performance and a lot of people were really excited about going to this thing and a lot of his friends went to this thing and he really wanted to go to this thing too but he had a plan to get on the US Wushu team and going to this competition, going to CMAT was one part of this plan that he had. His commitment was strong enough that he said no to this amazing opportunity to hang out with the Beijing Wushu team in order to compete at this competition where it didn't necessarily matter if he won or lost this particular competition but it gave him the experience he needed to level up for the next competition. I really admired that about him, that he had that level of commitment to really be dedicated to Wushu. So, good job, Brandon. The second thing is within Wushu, I think of this as being able to say no to the things with Wushu training that don't contribute to your core fundamentals of Wushu, the things that actually improve your Wushu. This is also, you know, socializing in class or talking or not focusing on what you're doing, but it's also what you're training. Is Nandu helping your fundamentals? Is learning a new form or a new style helping with your fundamental skills? If you learn a great new form, but your Mabu Gongbu transition still looks crappy, it's not like your new form is suddenly going to improve your Mabu Gongbu transition. You still need to focus on those fundamentals. And yeah, you could argue that learning a new form keeps you motivated, but I'm not talking about motivation. I'm talking about mastering Wushu. Motivation is a moot point. I've never heard anyone say that the more forms you know, the closer you are to mastering Wushu. But I have heard people say, that the better your fundamental techniques, the closer you are to mastering Wushu. So eliminate the fluff and focus on the core. Edit your training liberally so that you're really working on those deficiencies that will improve your Wushu the most. Again, and just to say this, because someone's gonna put in the comments, I'm not saying don't train your jumps, don't train your Nandu. It really depends on what your goals are. If your goals are directly related to jumps and Nandu, then that makes sense to train those things because they're fundamental to what you're trying to do. But if you do those things and expect to master Wushu as a result of doing them, without paying attention to the fundamental things, then you got a long road ahead of you. You know, I speak from experience. I want to learn, used to learn tons of forms. I want to learn Drunken Sword and Drunken Fist and Dog Boxing and Eagle Claw and Tiger Claw and Vantis and all this crap. And <laughs> at the end, honestly, right now, I'd just like to be able to do a really good Wu Chuan, a really nice Mabu Gombu transition. That would be amazing to me. But that means saying no to things that aren't Wu Chuan, saying no to things that aren't the Mabu Gombu transition. And like I said, those fundamentals are different for everyone. It depends on your goals. But I did write an article that's on wushuadventures.com that talks about the five wushu basics that contribute the most to your fundamentals. So check that out, I'll put a link down below. So what does this mean for me with Wushu 52? Well, externally it means that my other projects and explorations have to go by the wayside. I haven't talked about it here just because that's not really the focus of this channel or this topic, but I have a lot of things that take up my time. You know, I have my main job, I have my side job teaching at the university. Not only that, but I'm actively studying Japanese. I'm trying to build up this YouTube channel, which honestly, creating YouTube video content is a time suck. Seriously, it's ridiculous how much time having a YouTube channel takes. Plus I have interests in travel in other languages. I practice music, piano, guitar, ukulele. I do songwriting. I do digital art. I do painting. I do drawing. I like to cook and learn how to cook new dishes. And there's so many TV shows and movies to watch. The idea of saying no to a lot of these things is really hard. Partially because I've already invested a lot of time in some of these. I studied piano for 10 years when I was a kid. I've been playing guitar since I was 17. I've been drawing since I was 15. But they are distractions from doing wushu. And ironically, 
when I'm doing them, Wushu is a distraction for those things. So they're a distraction from Wushu and Wushu is a distraction from them. It goes both ways. And it's really hard for me. I have so many areas I'm interested in, so many things I wanna learn, but I also know myself. And I know that if I keep those things going, even a little bit, even a few minutes a day, it will distract me. It will take away my focus. And I think part of me actually likes being distracted. Part of me likes not having to focus because focus takes work. Focus takes energy. Focus is the hard path, not the easy one. But here's the thing. It's not an absolute never on those other things. Wushu 52 is just for one year. I could pursue them in the future. I mean, I'm 52, I don't have forever, but I could do them again. I still have many decades left to pursue interests. They're out there, maybe someday, but right now, they're not my focus, which means it's really time to say no to those things. And I don't think I could do the Warren Buffett only to have one thing, but I think I can narrow it down to two, Wushu and web design. Web design is my career, Wushu is my passion. But then within Wushu, internally, what do I need to say no to? And like I said, it depends on your goal. My goal has been to get into Wushu shape, whatever that means, so that I can train with a school or a class by the end of the year and go on Wushu adventures. So the goal for me is fundamental Wushu skill development. And for me, there's four areas, mobility and range of motion, strength and power, Wushu techniques and endurance. Those are the four core to say yes to. How far you can move, how strong you can move, for how long can you move, and the movement technique itself. You'll notice I don't have jumps in there. I don't have nandu. I don't have learn new forms. Saying no to teaching and coaching. Saying no to internal styles. Just focusing on those core four. So that's the first skill fundamental. The ability to say no to everything except your main priority. The next productivity skill is mastering the few, to reduce what you do to the fewest number of essential core activities. It sounds like it's similar to the first one. The first one's really saying no to other things. This one is narrowing it down, and really it's about the 80-20 principle, or the Pareto principle. What 20% of actions are gonna give you 80% of results in the Wushu Guan? Stop doing the busy work. Stop distracting yourself with organizing and preparing for training. Just get to work, but also, Get to work on the things that matter. Master those few essentials. In Wushu, what are those core essentials? What 20% of Wushu training will give you 80% of your results? I mean, what are they outside of techniques and then sp what specific techniques? Just in terms of physical ability and mastery, I think there are two things that contribute the most to good Wushu. Number one, flexibility and range of motion. Because you can't properly execute a technique if you can't actually get your body in the position it needs to be in. And the second is strength and power. If you don't have the strength to hold a stance or to do a technique or a kick, then you aren't doing Wushu correctly. I think that those are the main two contributors to Wushu technique. Yes, you need to practice the techniques too, but you know, for you coaches out there, having a student who already has the full range of motion and flexibility, who has great power and strength, teaching them new techniques in Wushu is so much easier than teaching someone who still is working on those fundamental physical abilities. Having those physical abilities in place would make Wushu way more enjoyable and fun to do. In terms of specific Wushu techniques, I mean, there's those five techniques I mentioned that are on wushuadventures.com, link below. But a lot of this depends on the style of Wushu you do and what your goals are with Wushu. If your goal is to become a Taiji teacher for senior citizens, then the fundamentals for you are different than someone who wants to be an external Wushu national champion. You would both focus on different fundamentals. So for Wushu 52, for myself, what are my essential few? Outside of techniques, I first agree with those first two, the range of motion and the strength and power. But for me, on top of that, another fundamental is body composition. Because doing Wushu when you're overweight is really hard. When you don't have excess body fat, doing Wushu is a completely different experience. So reforming my body fat percentage would have a significant impact on my Wushu ability and technique. It is a 20% that would have 100% impact on what my Wushu is like. In fact, being overweight inhibits the ability to have full range of motion and inhibits the ability to have full power and strength. If you're carrying around an extra 50 pounds, it's like having a weight vest on when you do Wushu. Not only that, but it's a really puffy weight vest that doesn't give you full range of motion. But within Wushu, I think there's probably about seven to eight techniques, especially for me as someone who focuses on Nanchuan. Nanchuan, you know, those seven to eight fundamental stances, Mabu, Gongbu, Shubu, Xiebu, Pubu, Tishi, Dingbu, Diabu, I guess Wubu Chuan as well. But right now I'm actually rethinking what my essential technique stack is. And this video is too long to get into that. But if you're interested, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a video about it.
And this leads us to the third fundamental of productivity, which is to have a high level of focus. And one thing that he talks about and a lot of people talk about is how focus or willpower to some degree is like a muscle. And you need to exercise that muscle to build up that ability to focus. And due in large part to just the nature of the modern world and media, technology, most of us, this ability to focus has completely atrophied. We're basically breeding a society of people with ADHD-like tendencies and reinforcing a lack of focus. I guess people who aren't focused tend to buy more stuff to distract themselves. So it's good for business, but bad for society. And unless we practice that skill and build that muscle, it's something that can be quickly depleted. Practicing focus takes practice. But like going to the gym, you just don't do it all at once. Break it down into small bite-sized chunks and work at it over time. Ironically, the ability to be consistently focused requires consistently practicing focus. So what does that mean with Wushu? How do we focus within our Wushu training? And what distracts us from our Wushu training? I think that focus in Wushu is really contributed by two things. The environment where you're training and the plan you have for your training. I mean, that's true with Wushu work, whatever you're doing. But let's think about environment. Where are you training? Are you in the Wushu Guan? Are you able to focus in that Wushu Guan? Are the people around you focused too, or are they distracting you? People trying to socialize. Is it cluttered? Is it at a gym or a park? Are you at home? Where are you the most focused on your training? And then your plan. What are you gonna do when you get to your training? Do you know what the basics you're gonna do are? What's your stretching routine? What's your post-class routine? How do you warm up? If you're training alone, what's the plan? If you're training with a coach, have they told you what their plan is? Have you asked them? Have you told them what you'd like to do? If you want to accomplish certain goals, you need to also communicate with your coach and create a plan that you can follow. You know, it's interesting. I think that with Wushu, at least for myself, when I'm in the process of training, I don't have a problem with focus. I'm able to focus while I'm training. I think the challenge for me is getting to the training and doing the training in the first place. And I guess environment is a little tricky for me too. I mean, training at a park is nice and all. It can be a little distracting. Going to the gym can be distracting too. But since I don't have a Wushu Guan to go to, I'm sort of in this situation. This is what I have to do. You know, a lot of people when they go to Wushu class, they like to socialize, they like to have conversations and talk and chat while they're working out. I am not one of those people. I don't want to have a conversation while I'm working out. I want to focus on the Wushu. If we're having a conversation, it's about how to improve the Wushu. I just want to train. I know that's not true for everyone, so I try to accommodate other people in certain situations. But if I'm going to a Wushu class, I just want to focus on training. And then after class, that's when we can socialize. We can hang out in a parking lot outside of a Chinese restaurant and talk all night. But in class, I just want to do Wushu. Honestly, for me, focus is a bigger issue with my work than with my training. But this isn't the platform to talk about that. And as for planning, that clearly isn't an issue for me either. I have no problem planning things. And like I said, I'm revamping my plan for developing fundamentals in Wushu. So I'm really just gonna be focusing on those core four areas that I mentioned before. And of course, the key to implementing that plan is consistency of action. Having a plan doesn't mean the plan gets done. Just like having a map doesn't mean you've finished your journey. You actually have to take the action to do the work. And the fourth fundamental of productivity is exactly that, consistency. Being able to outlast the competition, being able to outlast your old self. Endurance and stamina, are similar to this, but it's really about mental consistency, about regular practice. And this is where I suffer the most. This is my biggest challenge. Focus and consistency are really two sides of the same coin. They work together. Focus requires consistency and consistency requires focus. One consensus along a lot of productivity experts is that it's better to do small things more frequently than to do big things less frequently. James Clear talks about this a lot. BJ Fogg, who's a habit formation researcher at Stanford, talks about this a lot. It is more effective in habit formation to start with a very small, almost too easy thing. In fact, one of James Clear habit formation laws is make it easy, meaning that the habit is so easy it should almost be silly not to do it because habit formation equals being consistent with an action and to build consistency and it's best to focus on small daily practices of fundamentals so with wushu what is the consistency that we're trying to go for and like i said the key to consistency is thinking about frequency and scale how often you do something and how much of it you do and here's the thing for many of us the wushu consistency and scale is different if you're a wushu athlete in china then practicing once a day is actually less than optimal because you're used to training two or three times a day, six days a week. Six to eight hours a day of training is normal. So your level of consistency is at that height. Whereas if you're a part-time Wushu athlete, maybe daily training is a, a really high frequency for you. And maybe the scale of that training is like an hour is about as much as you can handle. So it really depends on what you're used to and what you've done in the past to determine what scale or frequency of developing a consistent routine works for you and your goals. And I think a lot of us gauge our training on what Chinese athletes do or what Russian athletes do. 
and we can't really do that because they're in a completely different situation. For someone like me, with Wushu 52, you know, I've been looking at myself over the past week and a half and thinking about when I naturally take actions towards a goal. You know, behavior patterns really do feel like grooves in a record. It keeps playing the same song over and over. In order to re-groove the record, you have to think about the easiest path to make that change. Oh, I'm sorry. A record is a disc with grooves in it that people used to put a needle on and it would play music. Kind of like a CD, which was a disc that people used to put in a machine to play music, kind of like an MP3. Uh, ask your parents. You know, another analogy is a river or stream. Trying to redirect a river by digging a huge canal is a lot of work. But if you find a place in the river where it naturally is right next to each other and just digging a little bit there, you can redirect that river completely with much less work. A few well-placed shovels can effect that change and push it over the edge. And the first thing I find helpful is keying my environment for those new habits. Again, James Clear has a law that's called make it obvious, which is to set up the opportunities to do the habit in the places where you are all the time. Since I spend most of my day working at home, I've been thinking about ways to optimize my home layout and the space near my desk to encourage regular activity in the right direction of training. I have an idea on this, but I'll share more on that in some other video if you're interested. But it really boils down to removing as many obstacles as possible to the habits that you want to form and to be consistent with those behaviors, to create those grooves and to redirect the path of that river of my life. Now I think there's not enough sun anymore. I'm going to take these off. Look at that dent from the glasses right there. So the fifth fundamental of productivity is being able to measure your progress. And what does this mean? Well, it means understanding the core metrics that you need to measure progress in the specific skills that you're trying to develop. What metrics will contribute the most to your success in that area? And if you're measuring the wrong things, then you'll end up on the wrong path. For example, if you're trying to build the skill of driving safely, then measuring how many miles you've driven doesn't contribute to that. It would be better to measure how fast you're driving. You know, tracking progress is important, but it's almost more important to track the right things. So with Wushu, what are the right things to track? Well, it depends on your goals. Are you trying to become a competitor? Are you trying to aim for mastery? Are you working for film? Are you working for performances? Do you want to be a teacher? Again, I think those fundamentals I mentioned before can give us a clue. Flexibility and range of motion, very easy to track those. These are measurable and directly influence your ability to do wushu. Strength and power, also directly measurable. You can measure how strong you are. Endurance, also measurable. Wushu techniques. Well, some aspects of techniques are measurable and some are not. The subjective aspects of wushu, flavor, rhythm, pacing, emotional content, those are hard to measure because they're subjective. But there are aspects of wushu that you can measure. Stance position, balance holding, whether your thumb is covering the right knuckles on your fists. All of those group A quality of movement judging criteria, those you can measure. So a simple approach would be to select those areas that you really want to measure and measure them. Take a before picture or before video, then follow a plan, hopefully with your coach to address those specific issues. You know, on Rebecca's video, she mentioned about head to toe and about specific techniques that she's working with her coach Dingwei to resolve. And that's fantastic. That's a great way to plan to overcome specific deficiencies you might have in your wushu. You don't have to pick a dozen of them. Just pick a couple, two or three to start, things that you really need to work on. For example, if you realize that head to toe is a fundamental technique that would contribute the most to your wushu and it's something you want to focus on, then measure it to start, then follow a program to improve that skill, take regular measurements and see how you're progressing until you achieve the skill. But like I said, I wouldn't pick more than a half dozen of those to start with, maybe two or three, maybe even one. You can always add more in the future, but this gives you something to work on. And with Wushu 52, of course, I have to ask myself, what is my goal? And then what is the metric that most relates to that goal? And of course, I mentioned this already. My goal is to get in Wushu shape so I can train with other people and go on Wushu adventures by the end of 2022. And I have those four areas, flexibility, range of motion, strength, which is specifically about bulletproofing my knees, ankles, and hip and improve range of motion in those areas. Three fundamental Wushu techniques and then body recomposition and fat loss. And fortunately, those are all measurable. The trick now is to figure out what my specific goals are for those areas and what specifically I'm going to measure and then take my before measurements to get a baseline. If you're interested in seeing what that looks like, let me know, I can make a video. And in case you're wondering, yes, I am repositioning myself every few minutes just to help with the blood flow. So what is the final fundamental for productivity? You know, I used to work for a man who would constantly talk about the importance of being willing to fail at something. In fact, he's the person who introduced me to Darren Hardy in the first place, who also talks about the benefits of failure. And they would both say that the faster you move towards failure, the quicker you'll be able to succeed because you learn from the failure and you can build your successes off that. Darren Hardy talks about how it's sort of like a pendulum. You have failure on one side and you have success on the other. And how far you move towards failure equals how far you move towards success. Unfortunately, you can't push it in the direction of success. You can only push it in the direction of failure. But a lot of people are very comfortable in this in-between stage where they're just kind of 
right here in their little comfortable zone. But the more discomfort you can experience, the more failure you can go through, the more success you'll be able to develop and the more you'll grow. But how can we embrace and seek discomfort? Shout out to Yes Theory. You know, we grow when we're pushed outside our comfort zone. If we're never uncomfortable, then there's no impetus to grow. You can't build a muscle unless you work the muscle. You can't grow your character unless you work your character. You can't develop patience unless you test your patience. Darren Hardy has some really good examples in that video, so check that out. But with Wushu, how can we push ourselves outside our Wushu comfort zone? Where are the opportunities for Wushu failure? I know that sounds silly because it feels like we're constantly failing with Wushu. I'm not really talking about physical discomfort. That's just part of the physical training in Wushu. But I'm talking about emotional discomfort, intellectual discomfort, that feeling you get almost like a fight or flight response, where you want to avoid a situation with your training because it just feels yucky. And I think this depends on the person and their training environment. Because how you fail with Wushu or what makes you uncomfortable with Wushu is probably different than what someone else is uncomfortable with Wushu. Maybe for you it's fear of performing or fear of competing. And for someone else, maybe it's something else. Fear of learning a new style. Fear of not getting the movement right away. The thing that frustrates you the most about Wushu is probably the thing that gives you the most discomfort about it. So I can't really say what specifically it might be for you for Wushu, but I think the idea of embracing that discomfort and pushing through it to learn and find success is still relevant even if you don't have a specific example. But then for me, where's my discomfort with Wushu? Where are my opportunities for failure? You know, this is tricky because I think myself and probably a lot of people, we sort of have a blind spot for the things that we don't like to do. We just naturally avoid them and so we don't think about them that often. Just naturally want to block those things out. I guess identifying and then embracing your discomfort is also a bit of a skill. One that I haven't really practiced in quite a while because to be honest, I notice I tend to take the easy path. I suppose in some respects making these videos and showing my current level of wushu is very uncomfortable. Maybe this is my effort to embrace the discomfort of showing everyone what my wushu looks like right now. I give major kudos to the people who are building their wushu up and posting it online because that ain't easy. Making myself publicly accountable for my wushu is very frightening. But if I think about it, it's also led to some initial success. I think there's more I can do, and this is just something that may require a little more introspection. I have to think about the areas of wushu that make me feel discomfort. So there you have it. These are the half dozen fundamental productivity secrets that Darren Hardy talks about. The thing is, the word productivity, I don't really like using it. It has a lot of connotations. A lot of people use the word productivity in a lot of different ways. But to me, it really just means being consistently working on something over time. But isn't that what Kung Fu is? High level of mastery developed through hard work over time. Kung Fu requires consistency. It requires focus. It requires saying no to other things. It requires mastering the vital few and ignoring distractions. It requires measuring your skill progression. And it requires being willing to make mistakes and look foolish and facing your fear. That's Gong Fu. Gong Fu is a measure of productivity. Because if you're not productive in whatever you're trying to master, whether it's cooking or driving or business, then you won't become a master of it. Then you don't build your Kung Fu. And if the skill you're trying to master is Wushu, then how do these half dozen or so fundamentals apply to that? So to me, just to summarize, they apply in very specific ways. Number one, saying no to distractions that take you away from your priority. In this case, two things for me, Wushu and web design. And so I'm embarking on a journey to eliminate those distractions from my life, which kind of sucks because I like a lot of those distractions. They're a lot of fun, but I don't have to go cold turkey. I'm going to identify them and then I'm going to wean myself off of them one by one. Number two, work on the vital few things that contribute the most to my wushu development. For me, those are three areas, flexibility, range of motion, strength and power, and body recomposition. If I can master those three areas or at least make huge improvements, it will directly impact my wushu. Even if I'm not actually practicing wushu techniques, it'll still have a great impact on the wushu that I do, at least to start. And like I said, I'm putting together my list of these action items. Maybe I'll have more about those specifically in another video. Three, improving the focus of my wushu training. Fortunately for me, this isn't too much of an issue. I tend to be pretty focused while I'm training but I can definitely try to improve the environment where I'm training and the environment at home when I want to do at-home training. And four, in tandem with focus is consistency. And I think the key here is building those small daily habits to contribute to long-term success rather than trying to do a big effort a few times a week and really contributing to that with the environment I mentioned at home to enhance those small daily routines. And five is being able to measure specific areas of progress. And as you know, four areas for me, flexibility and mobility, strength and power, wushu techniques, body recomposition. I will find key aspects of each and measure my initial state for each of those. That'll serve as my benchmark as I implement a plan to improve them over time. And six, I'm going to seek discomfort in my wushu training. I'm still figuring out what this means for me, but hey, 
No one's perfect. I never said I have all the answers. I'm just trying to figure this wushu training thing out like the rest of us. But if you have ideas on how to embrace discomfort in your wushu training, let me know. I'd like to hear what you have to say. I mean, not that I'll do them. I'm just curious. You know, I think I got down this rabbit hole because I realized that it took a, just a few things to completely derail my training efforts. Lack of sleep, fasting, inflammation. And yes, there are valid reasons for not training, but the ease at which my training ground to a halt was surprising, or at least a little disappointing. I had hoped my grit and determination were enough to weather these sorts of storms. So it was humbling to see that I'm subject to the same issues everyone else is. And I still have a lot of things to work through if I want to develop and grow my wushu abilities. You know, someone told me recently that wushu is hard. Even if you have a coach, even if you're going to a school, even if you're dedicated full-time to training, it's still hard to do. This is not an easy path for anyone to be on. And I have to remind myself that while I love doing wushu, and I love what wushu has to offer, I did not choose the easy sport. <laughs> so this is a good reminder of that. And I think, you know, my challenge with consistency is also one of the reasons I'm attracted to a few very specific philosophies and practices or approaches to life. Minimalism or essentialism or reducing down the unnecessary things from one's life. After all, if you remove the distractions and the non-essentials, then you're better able to focus on what's important and be consistent in that practice. And meditation and being mindful of the present moment and being mindful of the present practice. Because if you're focused and you're in the flow, then you'll be more consistent and effective with your efforts. So what do those mean for Wushu Adventures? What does it mean for web design? Well, like I said, I'm still on this journey. I'm still figuring things out, but I am definitely happy that you're here to keep me company. Here's the thing. This whole video, to be honest, has been a bit of a distraction. I mean, it's useful and helpful in terms of figuring out how to approach my Wushu training and how to reassess my skill development with Wushu 52. And hopefully it'll lead to long-term mastery or at least long-term improvement. But, you know, the time I took to make this video could easily have been used to train. I could have stretched. I could have worked on those fundamentals. I already broke my first rule. I said yes to a distraction when I should have said no to everything except the fundamentals. And it inhibited my ability to focus on this priority, which is to improve my wushu. Objectively, making this video does not directly improve my wushu. Maybe in a very circuitous way, but definitely not in terms of making me more flexible or stronger with my stances. But that's okay. While it's true, I still believe that in the long run, these videos and keeping myself accountable to everyone is going to pay dividends down the line. Maybe not in an obvious way, but if I can finally manage to address and improve my lifelong struggle with consistency and distractions and focus, then it would have been worth it. But here we are already at the end of week 10, two weeks with Naria Wushu training. Yes, my feet are swollen. Yes, I have the energy level of a narcoleptic panda, but I'm here, I'm at the park. The least I can do is practice my mabu, maybe get in a little stretching. So that's what I'm gonna do. You are welcome to watch me, but for now, that's enough talking. I have a game plan, I'm gonna work on it, but right now it's time for some action. Thank you so much for listening and watching and for your support and encouragement. I know I say this all the time, but I really do appreciate it. It means the world to me. So until next time, train hard, jayo.